where shall I start? I'm going to talk about a book that I finished reading recently um, about the French Revolution called Citizens by Simon Schama. I'll talk about that book a little bit. Where I'll end up in 12 to 15 minutes, if I keep my wits about me, is a thought experiment about how music or sound can uh, change a person positively, can free that person from karmic obscurations. And in the middle, I'll talk a little bit about um, billionaires and the guillotine. But let's suppose that music, music, induction, inductive music, uh, is an alternative to the guillotine. That's where I'm going to get to, I think. And as a use case, I'll talk about Donald Trump. Uh, but I could just as easily be talking about um, any, poli any politician. But it will be a politician. I think that I'll talk about, but it could be a non-politician. But I think in this particular instance, uh, I'm interested in the political ramifications of um, liturgical music. And we'll talk more about what I mean by liturgical music. But in general, what I mean is stuff like this. That's stuff that's on my Bandcamp site, and I think it does something to your brain, the listener, whether that listener is me or you, uh, that there's a kernel of resonance between those sounds and our physiology, and through our physiology to our spirit, to our soul, to our natural state of being, that this kind of music can um, soothe the afflictions of karma. And uh, having soothed the afflictions of karma, one is free to represent one's self in all of its impermanence and glory. So that's where I hope to get to the book. Citizens by Simon Shama. I like Simon Shama. I've read a book of his called A Landscape. Um, he has a series about uh, British history that I've not read, but it looks very good. I like Simon Shama. Uh, and I liked this book, but I would say for the section of this video that is really a a book review. I would say that this book assumes that you already know everything about the French Revolution. What he's particularly interested in demonstrating in this book uh, is to challenge the idea that the French Revolution uh, was primarily responsible for the modernization of the French state setting aside the terror, setting aside the bits that we already know about. He's particularly interested in demonstrating that up to the revolution, there were real steps towards liberalization being enacted by uh, the monarch, by the estates that were already uh, in control. And that as the revolution progressed, uh, it wasn't that there was a new body of leadership or uh, that new uh, participants in government took power. Uh, there weren't previously impoverished peasants who rose to the top of government. The people who ran the government during the revolution 
I think he's arguing are essentially the same people who were becoming in charge anyway. That, that the move away from aristocracy was kind of inevitable, was already happening. And that uh, many of the issues that faced the monarch and the uh, previous regime weren't solved by the revolution until the revolution adopted many of the practices that were part of that pre-revolutionary society. So I would say the first two-thirds of the book spend are dealing with the ten years prior to the revolution and talk about key figures, uh, characters, movements, changes in the law, changes in the culture that um, kind of uh, anticipate this modernization and liberalization, kind of a shift in power from landed aristocracy to money, the kinds of things that can very generally be said about um, the growth of capital or the growth of uh, social change. And that's all very, very interesting. Uh, it wasn't what I was looking for. I wanted a story about um, a little bit of a siren there. I wanted to know more about the actual events of from the um, general estates through the trial of Louis the Sixteenth uh, to the guillotining of Robespierre. That to me is what I was interested in because I don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, I read some and I think took a class or two on French Revolution in college, but that was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Uh, and so I know that the guillotine was used with ferocious frequency and that the chances are if you were uh, one of the politicians calling for many people to be sent to the guillotine, the chances are within a couple of months you would be going to the guillotine, um, up to and including Robespierre himself. I think I wanted to read more about Robespierre because I, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to Robespierre. In the same way, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to Oliver Cromwell. Like, um, there's a part of me that just think, yeah, cut their fucking head off. Charles the Third a current king of England uh, could have his head cut off. Now I say that and I'm not a revolutionary because I'm squeamish and I don't, you can't have a revolution without bloodshed and I don't want bloodshed so therefore I am neither a, a revolutionary nor a particularly active activist. Uh, and the guillotine is so final, isn't it? I mean, d death is final. There just seems something particularly final about the guillotine. Um, so I, I would be delighted for Charles III. It is Charles III, right? Our current Charles, Charles Sax Coburg. Um, I'd be happy for him no longer to be king because there would no longer be a king. I think that would be an excellent move. Uh, I personally would not want him to be guillotined. I would want him to retire. I would give him a modest state pension, as is the due of any British citizen, my understanding. We don't have anything like that in this country. People his age who weren't king and were unemployed would just have to eat dirt eat shit, eat rats, I don't know. I don't want that for him. Let him get a small bungalow by the seaside somewhere, you know, with his wife, when his grandkids come and visit him, play in the sand with a little plastic spade, build sand castles. That's okay, that's okay for Charles. Um, he doesn't need to be guillotined. Uh, Elon Musk, also doesn't need to be guillotined, but 
he doesn't need to have hundreds of billions of dollars. The fact that we live in a world where individuals can accrue that much wealth is obscene and activates the little lizard part of my brain that appreciates the guillotine. I don't want to see Jeff Bezos, um, neither Jeff Bezos nor Elon Musk, uh, nor Richard Branson, I'm trying to think of other billionaires. They don't need to be guillotined. Uh, let them live off Social Security. I'm sure they've made quite adequate payments into the Social Security system. Uh, but their wealth should be confiscated because it's immoral that they've been allowed to accumulate that much wealth. It is wonderful that capitalism allows that much wealth to be generated. And I will give the market, the capital market, credit for being able to generate that much wealth. But there comes a point where the wealth needs to be distributed. And we live in a, a world uh, where our legal system allows for that wealth to uh, be in e unequally uh, divided. And it is not only unfair, it is a failure of justice. And one that, again, I think the guillotine is a viable answer to. Now, not an answer I would provide because I'm not a revolutionary, because I don't care for bloodshed. Maybe it's a lack of fortitude. But neither of those people should have that much money. I would argue there's a case that the idea of currency has um, reached its apogee and is now on, we've passed peak currency and now we're waiting for the alternative. Um, the alternative is uh, communalism, which again is an element of the French Revolution. Uh, Shaman doesn't talk an awful lot about it, like the, the trial and guillotining of guillotinage, the guillotining of Louis the Sixteenth, then the eventual um, uh, guillotining of, of his wife, Marie Antoinette. That part of the book takes, I don't know, 10% of the book, if that. Uh, and then from right there to the death of Robespierre is just a little, a little nubby bit at the end of the book. It's just not what he's interested in. He's interested in the lead up and supporting that idea that much of what we think of when we look back and say that the revolution was a modernizing force, that those forces were already prevalent. And I'm, I'm not saying he's wrong, I'm just, I wanted to explore a little bit more about the guillotine. Um, so we're not going to guillotine the billionaires, but they cannot be allowed to maintain their uh, ill-gotten ill -gotten life. And it is ill-gotten. It may be legal, uh, but that's not a selling point. We have a legal structure that allows for the accumulation of individual wealth, which is all extracted either from the commonwealth or from the labor of the common people, from the populace. Uh, and in a just system, that wealth would be distributed, either literally by redistributing or by simply living in a world where to each unto his needs and from each according to his skills, or their skills. So what's my solution? If I'm not gonna guillotine them, and we can't, obviously, there's no way in modern America that anyone's gonna vote for a redistribution of the billionaire's wealth. For some reason, we all think that that's something that we can aspire to, or we all feel 
aligned with the interests of the billionaires somehow or entertained by them. I don't know fucking know what it is. I'm not aligned with them or entertained by them. Uh, if they were in all other aspects a wonderful human being, the fact that they have that much money makes them an asshole, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so what would I do? Well, here, this is what I mean. I would have them come join me in my living room. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about Donald Trump, who's not a billionaire. Uh, he's some amount of fraudulent wealth. Uh, he was actually president of the United States. Now, I know that no one comes here to hear about politics, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the difference between Donald Trump and every other president we've ever had. Um, I'm not a fan of his, but not particularly a fan of the alternatives. We, we'll just set that aside. Let's just assume that when I say Donald Trump, you can imagine Joe Biden. If you think that Joe Biden is in charge of an international crime cartel, uh, we'll, we'll sit there. Now, I believe that if Donald Trump listened to this music, and he would have to probably be compelled to listen to it at first because no one wants to hear it. Um, have any of you listened to any of these tracks? I don't, I don't know. Um, so he certainly didn't, wouldn't want to listen to it. But I feel like if he listened to three or four minutes, uh, he would start to relax physically. I would give him a Coke or Diet Coke or whatever it is he likes. And after 20 minutes or so, the agitation in his karma would diminish. The grasping to the notions of greed, uh, self-aggrandizement, uh, power, sex, uh, golf, food, whatever it is that floats in his brain, um, would settle off a little bit. And at the core of Donald Trump is um, a, a tiny little Buddha with a tiny little bit of light that will shine through. And uh, I don't know what he would do from there, but I would trust his motivations. Well, he may end up doing exactly the same things that he's doing now, but I would reckon that he was doing it with a clear review, perhaps still with malice and narcissism, in which case he would have to come back in for a second listening session. I know you're all sitting there thinking, who am I to judge Donald Trump? And that's a that's a valid a valid criticism. Um, and I'll, I'll, let's take it up um, in the comments or in email. Um, I picked Donald Trump because he particularly triggers me and uh, I can see myself get agitated when I think about him and that's not a good thing uh, but I can also see that I don't want to throw him to the to the guillotine part of me does a little lizard part in the back of my head wants to see Donald Trump uh, on the guillotine but but I don't because it's a gross thing to do um, far more effective is to have him sit and listen to these sonic sculptures and I think this is where I, I'm trying to get to is that um, I think sound and music can uh, take the place of the guillotine the guillotine will cut someone's head off this music will uh, self-liberate thought and karma and from there 
who knows what will happen, but probably not what we're doing now. Probably not accumulation of indecent amounts of wealth. Probably not insane injustice in terms of our access to health care. Again, I'm very privileged in my access to health care. I've had, as you know, uh, a round of very invasive, very complex, very expensive surgery that has kept me alive. Um, because I have employee provided health care, my employer provides health care to me. Well, that's great for me, but uh, it's bullshit, right? It's bullshit that access to health care is predicated on having a job. And uh, not just any job, but a certain kind of job that includes those kinds of benefits. I think it's appalling that that's the society we live in. Um, there's a part of me that expects that when the revolution comes, assuming it isn't my musically inductive revolution, uh, there'll be plenty of people clamoring to put me on the bloody guillotine. And uh, I just have to kind of do this, and I, I can't really argue with them. Uh, so what I'm hoping instead is that all of you will listen to all of this music on Bandcamp and that you will share it and that piece by piece, slowly by slowly, um, this and related kinds of liturgical music will change our politics, change our health care, change our economics, and how all those things interact. Anyway, let me, let me, know, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I know this is a bit of a different content from what I have been talking about probably um, probably not what, what probably not what you want to hear even if you agree with me you might want to be here for um, meditation instruction but we'll see maybe this is the video that shoots off and uh, thousands of new subscribers arrive on account of this this video we'll see won't we we'll see if you got this far you have to drop a comment and let me know and so with that you know you keep your wits about you and I will be back soon with um, I think my next video is going to be a, a a remix video where I take a recording of a chamber music piece and I use some uh, I can't remember what it's called it's a it's a plugin that does a bunch of really cool stutter effects kind of recreate a sound world based on remixing that original recording. The recordings from when I was in grad school, so the mid-90s, 30 years ago. Is that right? Yep. Time. Time goes. <laughs>